It's that time again, when thousands of Swiss Army members and the Air Force are deployed to protect the elite representatives of the bourgeoisie from all countries, who meet in Davos, Switzerland from January 16th to January 20th to talk about the future of the planet and the global economy. As opposed to the G7 or G20, where politicians meet, we see here many members among that class which is the true ruling force in the world, those above the state leaders. The World Economic Forum has always been the subject of many conspiracy theories, and it is not without reason. It's the most powerful networking event, a unique lobbying platform bringing together the who's who of the unelected decision makers of global capitalism, with immense opportunities to connect with and influence political actors. The Davos meetings are shrouded in mystery, many of the important conversations are off-screen, critical media outlets are denied access. But the most prominent theory today, the core tenet of the Davos conspiracy, revolves around an initiative launched by the World Economic Forum, or short, the WEF, in 2020 called the Great Reset, through which a secret pedophile cabal of global elites plan to harvest children's blood, depopulate humanity through Covid and other means, killing off billions of people, and utilize the pandemic and the climate hoax to turn off the lights in cities, abolish private property, confiscate cars, take away your pets, and establish a high-tech dictatorship, ushering in a satanic, communist new world order in which you're forced to eat bugs. What is the Davos Forum up to? What are they really cooking? And is there some truth to the Great Reset conspiracy? It is important to know what the WEF stands for, to know about its goal and challenge to create unity among the capitalist class as a manifestation of the cause of imperialism, and to understand why the right wing has put the World Economic Forum at the heart of its modern propaganda. The headquarters of the WEF is based in Colony in the French-speaking province or canton of Geneva. The WEF has also offices in New York, Beijing and Tokyo. Its flagship annual meetings are held in Davos, located in the largest Swiss canton Graubünden in the Eastern Alps. Davos is known as one of the largest Swiss ski resorts, with tourism being a primary component of its local economy, luxury boutiques and unique restaurants secluded in the mountains, thus serving as a perfect setting for networking among the upper classes. Not least because Switzerland is regarded as a relatively stable safe haven of global capitalism. The forum is, aside from public subsidies, funded by its 1,000 member companies, typically multinational corporations with revenues of over 5 billion US dollars, who pay around 60,000 Swiss francs for yearly membership, including the participation of their leaders at the Davos meetings. Key strategic partners, predominantly among the most powerful corporations, who collaborate more closely with the WEF, pay over 600,000 dollars. Its stated mission is to engage, quote, foremost political, business, cultural and other leaders of society to shape global, regional and industry agendas. The World Economic Forum was founded in 1971 by German business professor and engineer Klaus Schwab. First it was called the European Management Forum and then changed its name to the World Economic Forum in 1987, partly due to the reason of its success and its ambition to broaden the scope of its vision. Going from a business management forum connecting European and North American business leaders to include more political aspirations, such as providing a platform to resolve international conflicts. A very coherent ambition, since in the end international conflict can be traced back to business competition quite well. In 1988, Greece and Turkey signed the Davos Declaration, preventing an escalation into war. A few years later, Nelson Mandela met with the South African President Frederick Willem de Klerk at Davos. The managing board acts as the executive body of the WEF and is currently headed by the forum's president, the conservative Norwegian politician and diplomat Børge Brende. 
Founder Klaus Schwab is the executive chairman and he is guided by a board of trustees, which today includes figures such as Indian billionaire and eighth richest man in the world Mukesh Ambani, Salesforce's Mark Benioff, CEO of BlackRock Larry Fink, Nestle CEO Mark Schneider, or European Central Bank President Christine Lagarde. The WEF has been criticized on many grounds, such as its decision-making processes being undemocratic and unaccountable to regular people, or the lacking of financial transparency. The Davos participants love to talk about climate change and how to combat it, while using over a thousand private jets to get to Switzerland. The security arrangements for the meeting of the global ruling class are high as expected. Between 800 and 1,000 police officers are usually on duty along with the Swiss military, also not exactly very ecological. The canton of Graubünden alone contributed around 9 million Swiss francs in 2020. The federal government spent 32 million Swiss francs, mostly for security, including surveillance of the airspace and so on. The WEF itself contributed only 2.25 million, a fraction of what is paid by the public, and that despite the forum having reserves of over 300 million francs. The WEF serves as a regular training ground for the police and the military apparatus with its newest technology to guard Switzerland against internal threats. And it's an opportunity for the police in various cities to train their anti-riot and anti-uprising operations against the countless organized anti-WEF protests every year. The forum accounts for more than half of the total Davos revenues, has the status of a foundation and therefore enjoys tax advantages. The public sector in Switzerland therefore does not see too much of a considerable portion of revenues generated by the meeting. The WEF claims to be non-partisan, impartially standing above particular national or party interests. Obviously this is a lie. The World Economic Forum stands for a very concrete kind of politics. The Great Reset Initiative is a post-pandemic recovery plan emphasizing sustainable development, more equitable outcomes, and a rethinking of government expenditure and global investment. The plan is vague and filled with nice-sounding phrases, like a speech of a politician or a corporate mission statement, and thus provides fertile ground for conspiracy theories to foster. One of the key components is stakeholder capitalism. The WEF is known for advocating for multi-stakeholderism in its vision for global governance. The stakeholder approach is the culmination of modern business school buzzwords strung together, letting CEOs feel like they're part of something bigger than being capitalist exploiters or money makers. It means that companies should serve not just shareholders, that is, their owners and consequently short-term profits, but also other groups, such as the customers, suppliers, their workers, the public or the environment. That corporations should be part of seeking solutions to inequality or climate change, not just governments or the UN. But the idea of making capitalism more humane and green is nothing new. It sounds more dramatic than it is, and deliberately so. While all of this may sound heartwarming to naive 19-year-old business students and liberal wannabe activists, What's behind it is neither spectacular nor original. It's a hideous, bourgeois dream to make capitalist entities take up functions and responsibilities of public bodies such as the government. That the winners of the system, the profiteers of past crises, are now to step up and solve the problems they are themselves causing, such as climate disaster, unemployment and rising inequality. After decades of pushing for so-called neoliberal policies and being co-responsible for the disasters facing humanity today, the forum wants, once again, to present itself as the problem solver, yet again, by pushing a better kind of capitalism. What is ultimately driving this is what has always driven capitalist states to concede social benefits to the working class. Fear of revolution. Quote, Failing to address and fix the deep-rooted ills of our societies and economies could heaten the risk that, as throughout history, ultimately a reset will be imposed by violent shocks like conflicts and even revolutions. 
Shortly after the WEF's announcement of the Great Reset, the editorial director of the libertarian think tank the Heartland Institute, which receives funding from the fossil fuels industry, wrote that, quote, The socialist outline is clear. Destroy the global capitalist economy and reform the Western world. The Great Reset conspiracy narrative quickly took the right-wing ecosystem by storm and has now become a core talking point. One might even say a keynote in the worldview of much of the mainstream right. So whoever is powerful enough to construct a total reset will construct it in a way that we have even less freedom than we've ever had. It's seemingly everywhere and its scope has grown far beyond the COVID pandemic, now including issues such as inflation, immigration or climate change. When Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said in a speech at the UN that this pandemic has provided an opportunity for a reset. The video of it went viral. It trended on Google and Twitter by the end of 2020, with most of the prominent right-wing accounts tweeting about it. A petition with thousands of signatures against it was set up. Canadian right-wing politicians warned against the elites taking over. During a Conservative Party leadership race, candidate Pierre Poilievre stated he would ban federal ministers from taking part in the Davos meetings if he became prime minister. In the US, the Great Reset has been a theme within the right wing for quite some time, with figures such as Lou Dobbs, Laura and Graham, Ben Shapiro, Glenn Beck, Candace Owens, Steve Bannon or Tucker Carlson talking about it, and outlets such as OANN, Breitbart News or Fox News, the most watched cable news network in the US, promoting it. Right-wing politicians such as Paul Gosar from Arizona or Marjorie Taylor Greene of Georgia have pushed it as well. Greene told Alex Jones that liberal politicians from around the world were supporters of the Great Reset, warning that it was gonna bring socialism to the US. One of the first right-wingers to push it was Steve Milloy, who took part in the Trump administration's EPA transition team, who said that future legislation on methane reductions could be framed as proof of the Great Reset. In 2020, Catholic Archbishop Carlo Maria Viganò sent a letter to Trump in which it said that the global elite are conspiring to take over the world through the Great Reset and imploring him to stop the final assault of the children of darkness. He wrote that, quote, a global plan called the Great Reset is underway. Its architect is a global elite that wants to subdue all of humanity, imposing coercive measures with which to drastically limit individual freedoms and those of entire populations. Turning Point USA hosted an event called Defeating the Great Reset with speakers including Jack Posobiec, Charlie Kirk, the group's founder, and Steve Bannon, who told the loud sold out crowd, quote, are we here to learn about or understand or compromise or accommodate the Great Reset? We are here to defeat it. Defeat the Great Reset, the crowd answered. But it's not just the North American right wing that made the Great Reset part of their propaganda. In Australia, spectator columnist James Dellingpole was interviewed on Sky News Australia, which is owned by Rupert Murdoch, also the owner of Fox News, said that, quote, anyone who doesn't realize that the Great Reset is the biggest threat to our form of life right now hasn't been paying attention. Klaus Schwab, with his German accent, was labeled a charismatic German and a dangerous Marxist leader by the Australian news channel. And what would the right wing be without the Europeans? Leader of the Dutch right wing Forum for Democracy Party, Thierry Baudet, asked on Facebook whether COVID-19 was used as a crowbar for the new world order as part of the Great Reset. Already in 2020, he had claimed that the Jewish billionaire George Soros had manufactured the coronavirus to steal our freedoms and promoted the podcast of a prominent Dutch QAnon influencer. Unsurprisingly, many web conspiracy theories are full of anti-Semitic tropes. It's the usual ones that are supposedly in control of the forum, such as George Soros or the Rothschild family, as part of a worldwide Zionist conspiracy. The right-wing web conspiracies may have trended especially during the pandemic, but they have not gone away. They are here to stay for a long time.
Conservative Irish politician Matthew McGrath spoke just last December about the Great Reset in the Lower House in Ireland. This all might sound like some sort of uh, conspiracy, and I wish it was, but it is not. Where am I good? All right, we'll see who will have the last laugh. Then you have the sort of seemingly level-headed, moderate right-wing take on the Great Reset, such as expressed in this article recently boosted by Jordan Peterson, in which the author, a distinguished fellow of the American Institute for Economic Research, says that while he denounces the wild conspiracy theories, there is still an imperative to denounce the forum. And why? For its imperialist ambitions? No. He says, the agenda of Davos is alarming. Its vision amounts to top-down authoritarian corporatism, corporations and states coming together, and is a danger to the free market, the sovereignty of nations, and liberty in general. Yet again, we have this idea that there is a pure, good capitalism, and that the Davos masterminds want to replace that with a different sort of system. The blame, yet again, is not put on capitalism itself, but something foreign to it. It always begs the question, what does this pure, freedom-loving capitalism look like? When was this time when the capitalist state wasn't in close connection to the rich and didn't support the capitalist class and the system of private property? And why do the most successful global corporations the epitome of capital largely support these agendas if those are so dangerous to capitalism itself. Tightly knit connections between the state and corporations are in fact not a deviation from capitalism. It is the capitalist system taken to its logical conclusion. There was in fact no time where companies and the capitalist state were separate. From the very beginning, it is the very state that enforced the very rules that allows for such a development to happen in the first place. Yes, companies are more concentrated and centralized today, but this too is just the natural tendency of capitals, which accordingly necessitates a more tight relationship with the centralized capitals and the state, which is structurally geared towards strengthening their and its own interrelated economic and political might. And this cannot be repeated often enough. Whenever the government does stuff, such as intervening in the market, this is FFS, not socialism. Socialism presupposes a phase in which the government acts in the interests of the working class and not the bourgeoisie, as is the case today. Even state ownership does not change this fact. As Friedrich Engels wrote, quote, But the transformation, either into joint stock companies and trusts, or into state ownership, does not do away with the capitalist nature of the productive forces. The modern state, no matter what its form, is essentially a capitalist machine, the state of the capitalists. The workers remain wage workers, proletarians. The capitalist relation is not done away with. People's fears that the WEF agenda wants to take away their property is ironic, since capitalism already undermines the ability of most people to own anything and concentrate wealth into the hands of a small minority. Whenever people express this fear of global socialism, they more often than not fear for their own wealth. They express the fears of the pro-capitalist petty bourgeoisie, whether they are small business owners themselves or not. Some of this stuff is just genuine ignorance on the part of people falling for this. But much of it is a genuine reactionary urge to stop any change toward a sustainable economy and but a prelude to the fascist backlash revolutionary Marxists have to deal with when they will actually change the mode of production toward fulfilling human needs and in harmony with the environment. What we see in all of these right-wing interpretations is what you can see throughout the history of the right-wing bourgeois movement, namely the attempt to draw in anti-establishment sentiment which is naturally widespread among the exploited working class and deflect it from an anti-capitalist critique in order to co-opt it into a reactionary pro-capitalist narrative. One example of this is the new far-right prime minister, Giorgia Meloni, ranting about financial speculators. In my previous video, we've talked about how she would frequently mention the globalists and the corrupt liberal parties 
undermining Italian sovereignty. Yet, if you look at the funding numbers of her party, you see many of those large corporations and interest groups from foreign countries. Meloni herself being part of the Aspen Institute, based in Washington, D.C., which has many connections to the World Economic Forum. This undermining doesn't have to be done consciously by every right-winger, although that's part of it. It's just something that is incentivized by the capitalist system. Such as when industrialists decided to fund the Nazi party because, among other things, their reactionary nationalist narrative was a potent deterrent against the then massively popular class struggle narrative of the fast-growing socialist movement. If you combine ignorance, chauvinism, widespread anti-communism, and capitalists constantly pushing their interests through the corporate media and various think tanks, you get this mess. Constantly new conspiracy theories about a minority, about a particular institution, about a particular group of the elite, often Jewish of course, which are made responsible instead of the whole capitalist class and the whole profit-based system. Efforts such as the WEF reflect a very rational wish of the large capitalists, namely to move towards a single world trust, a single global capitalist federation, which would ensure a single global market for maximum power and wealth. If the WEF expresses the needs of capital, how come so many pro-capitalist parties are critical of it? How can we explain that some bourgeois parties are anti-globalists while others aren't? The disagreements between liberals and conservatives strongly reflect the inherent contradictions of the ruling class within a nation and internationally, stemming from capitalist competition, which in no way disappears with the emergence of monopolies. For instance, we have the large fossil fuel companies which, although donating to both parties in the US, still tend to donate more to conservatives. Finance companies tend to give more money to Democrats in the US today. Many of those who work to push right-wing theories about the Great Reset are linked with organizations which receive lots of funding from fossil fuel companies, such as the Heartland Institute or the Committee for a Conservative Tomorrow, whose employee, Mark Morano, wrote this book. In the newest era of globalization, the so-called global upper middle class have experienced a relative loss in income due to the outsourcing of jobs, increased international competition, and so on. So convincing those workers that globalization and the organizations pushing it becomes relatively easier by, yet again, distracting from the main problem. However, these different fractions are ultimately largely united when it comes to defending the power of the rich, and people are often distracted by relatively minor tactical disagreements. The liberal side of bourgeois parties may pose as climate-friendly, but anyone who's looking at the numbers knows that they aren't doing anything significant against climate disaster either. The WEF is a reflection of that uniting tendency on an international stage. Karl Kautsky of the German Social Democrats comically postulated right before the outbreak of World War I that this would lead imperialism toward ultra-imperialism, a stage approaches in which the competition among states will be disabled by their cartel relationship. Vladimir Lenin, however, countered this analysis by stating that, quote, the development in this direction is proceeding under such stress, with such tempo, with such contradictions, conflicts, not only economical, but also political, national, etc., that before a single world trust will be reached, before the respective national finance capitals will have formed a world union of ultra-imperialism, imperialism will inevitably explode, capitalism will turn into its opposite. So while what the UF is trying to accomplish is not impossible in theory, the competition of various imperialist entities is too great for the world to not explode into war or revolution before Davos reaches its goal. And it is within these contradictions through which we have to understand both the role of organizations such as the WEF and the political rejection or embrace by the various bourgeois parties and the according ideological manifestations, such as their differences on protectionism, immigration or international bodies like the European Union. The ultimate goal is to move toward a world federation where borders are irrelevant, but of course based on global cooperation and not capitalist competition. So, to conclude, why are these conspiracy theories so attractive and thus successful? 
Because they partly speak to legitimate fears of people, of losing control in the face of an unaccountable ruling class, or facing even more financial hardship. Anti-establishment narratives are attractive and potent, not least because it is all too obvious that the status quo is deeply ridden with injustice and corruption. People are often rightly frustrated with the green capitalism shift, because it is done for the benefit of the rich, at the cost of the working class, who has to shoulder increasing costs, while the wealthy are allowed to fly around in their private jets for lunch. Fascist parties have historically exploited exactly this frustration, pointing fingers at the liberal elite, only to subvert the communists' appeal. The conspiracy narrative is often exciting, because it simplifies a complex world. But the truth is exciting enough. People just have to make that step to be open for the Marxist analysis. If you consider yourself open-minded and critical enough to reject the establishment narrative, then consider being even more critical and more open-minded and actually read the people most demonized by that same establishment, namely the Marxists. Obviously, just because an alternative explanation is labeled a conspiracy theory, it does not automatically follow that it's false, of course. Powerful people conspire all the time, and the label itself is often politically motivated. But in this case, I hope to show not only that most right-wing narratives about the WEF don't make sense, but that they're actively misleading the working class from seeing the true enemy here. The WEF is part of the problem. But it is not the real source of problems, it's capital. Without the big corporations, organizations like the Forum would be hot air. And just because much of the conspiracy stuff is nonsense, there is a real danger expressed by the Great Reset Initiative of corporations gaining even more influence over every aspect of life and nature, and the states likely getting more repressive in the future as capitalism imperialism is in decay. In 2019, over 400 civil society organizations prepared a letter calling for the termination of an agreement between the UN and the UEF, a direct result of the stakeholder approach, which provides transnational corporations preferential access to the UN system with regard to development work. And in 2020, the UN Secretary General called for the creation of a multi-stakeholder high-level body for challenges of the digital world, with participants including Facebook, Microsoft, Google, and the WEF. The stakeholder approach came to the surface during the TRIPS waiver battle, where, through the influence of actors such as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, international bodies were hampered in their efforts to waive patents to make the COVID vaccine more accessible for low-income countries. You likely know someone in your broader circle of friends or family who buys into some of these right-wing ideas about the WEF. In trying to argue with them, try to drag them away toward the Marxist analysis, if even just a little bit. But also bear in mind that many of these people are too far gone and it'll cost you too much energy and time to achieve small success. In reading and watching stuff for my research, I found that, unsurprisingly, much of the Great Reset conspiracy crowd is simply imbued with rabid anti-communism. People really worried about their financial investments, such as this finance advice YouTuber, who spends much of his time talking about how murderous socialism is and how Davos is gonna take away his stuff. Talks. In the end, arguments can only get us so far. What we need is organization, and international organization. Because, while divided, capitalists organize globally, and the proletariat can only combat this assault of the bourgeoisie by organizing internationally as well. Because, as opposed to the capitalists who benefit from the inherent competition of the market system, the proletariat can only gain by cooperation and unity beyond borders, and exploit that inherent weakness of a systemically divided ruling class, which organizations such as the World Economic Forum, despite great efforts, will never be able to reconcile.